Hello, my name is Jason Stone, and today we're going to be talking about the factors of getting and keeping attention. I'm an instructor of speech here at OSU OKC. One of the most important things you can do as a public speaker is to get and keep your audience's attention. Clinical research shows that the average uh, attention span of a, a college-aged person uh, is somewhere around eight to 10 seconds of continuous attention span. So if you begin your presentation in a boring fashion, or if you begin your presentation without much consideration as to how you're going to continue to captivate the audience's attention, uh, then you may wind up having some, some difficulties uh, as you present your material. So one of the things that we're going to learn about uh, in this lecture and in the lecture that will uh, happen after this are, are the 11 factors of keeping and gaining attention. They are vital to holding your audience's attention, and you have to start off on a good note uh, with the audience in order to make sure that you continue to command their attention throughout the entirety of your presentation. So our presentation is about turning these types of audiences into this type of an audience. And uh, if your audience looks like this, then you have a lot of problems as a public speaker. Uh, most of the material that you're attempting to communicate uh, to that audience uh, is not going to be something that they retain. Uh, it's very difficult to retain things uh, when it's being spoken to you while you're asleep. Uh, so you want to make sure that your audience looks more like this. And these uh, audience members have obviously been engaged uh, by uh, some compelling factors of keeping and gaining attention. And uh, I would recommend highly that you pay m a lot of attention to these 11 factors of keeping and gaining attention. Not only are you going to want to start your presentations off with one of these 11 factors, but in addition to that, you're always going to want to integrate at least one of them about every uh, three to five minutes to make sure that you're engaging the audience. So how do you learn about these factors of keeping and gaining attention? Well, you will obviously need a guru, a, a yogi, a shaman, a medicine man, a sensei, an enlightened oracle to lead you and show you the way perhaps maybe even a coach. Luckily you have me. I will be your instructor. I will show you the 11 factors of keeping and gaining attention and how to apply those back to public speaking. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I have over 16 years of coaching and mentoring experience enhancing other people's performance. I was a university professor and a debate coach for nine years. I've taught a number of web enhanced courses and I've also taught scores of faculty enhancement seminars and lectures. I'm familiar with multiple different instructional enhancement software programs. I don't have a lightsaber, a Super Bowl ring, an NBA championship, or a Big 12 title, but I've got some presentation skills. Pretty much if you can do it in front of an audience, I have done it or can do it. <laughs> Pay particular attention to uh, the videos that will be loaded in the course a little bit later. We'll learn all about how to properly use PowerPoint a little bit later in the semester. Let's begin with a definition of attention. The act or state of attending, especially through applying the mind to an object or a sense of thought. A condition of readiness for such attention involving especially a selective narrowing or focusing of consciousness and receptivity. Now those are of course uh, denotative, uh, dictionary-esque sort of definitions, and really what we're focusing in on is the ability to command what the audience is attending to, and the ability to command the audience's attention in public speaking types of formats. So uh, what you really want to concern yourself with specifically are the 11 different factors uh, that are on your screen now. Those are activity, reality, proximity, conflict, humor, suspense, familiarity, the novel, the vital, the similar, history, and uh, we will talk about each of those 11 different factors uh, in a great deal of detail as the lecture progresses. So let's uh, begin with that first one, and that is activity. Okay, you want to have uh, activity. Any of these factors of keeping and gaining attention, however, involve imagination. And uh, the reason that I show you that graphic is because it can be a tree, uh, or if you apply a little bit of technology and a little imagination back to it, uh, it could potentially uh, be a face. Uh, you have to, of course, know what you're doing with both of those things uh, in terms of imagination and technology. So we will discuss all 11 of these different factors of keeping and gaining attention. Uh, before I begin, though, I'd like to attribute uh, some source citations. 
Uh, some of this is borrowed from uh, Professor Kaminsky uh, at Webster University in St. Louis, Missouri, who originally published some of this information on the World Wide Web, uh, August 15, 2001. Uh, Professor Kaminsky cites as his source uh, Erninger, uh, and that's uh, Principles of the Types of Public Communication, 9th edition, 1986. This slide is an interesting one. Uh, no, that doesn't work. Those first two slides are way too dynamic. If I can put everyone to sleep within the first minute, then the rest of the presentation should go very well. Uh, that is obviously not an effective public speaking strategy. You want to try to get everyone's attention from the get-go, uh, as opposed to trying to uh, bore everyone to death uh, during the beginning. Boredom is not a strategy. It is a side effect of a lack of preparation and a total lack of empathy for the audience. Uh, it should not be your strategy. So, let us begin by talking about activity. You must understand that the lectern is not a shield. You shouldn't hide behind the lectern. Uh, many uh, professors deliver the entirety of, of their presentation uh, from behind a lectern. Uh, I oftentimes make an attempt to uh, move out uh, into the audience to negotiate uh, for different uh, sorts of perspectives. I'm somewhat limited uh, here by uh, the actual uh, the actual uh, perspective of the camera uh, for this particular lecture, uh, but if, if I wanted to, uh, I could maybe uh, move over here. And uh, I think that you know, that would be uh, a more effective uh, potential place uh, for me to present you know, some of this material. Uh, if this uh, were a, a non-televised class, uh, I would move around quite a bit, and uh, I would uh, make various use of, of my negotiation of proximity back and forth. Uh, to the audience. I might even get you know, somewhat closer to some of the audience members like this and uh, try to move around. Uh, uh, not as much as possible because you don't want to wind up looking you know, like a caged animal, uh, but it is important that you uh, make an attempt to, to get out amongst the audiences and uh, to move to, to negotiate uh, proximity in such a way uh, as to engage the audience. So uh, I would invite you to experiment around with that. Uh, sometimes that's uh, a little difficult on the folks uh, who are uh, responsible for making sure that the camera stays on you, uh, but uh, other times uh, it can be an effective way to try to captivate the audience or to uh, get the audience to pay attention, and that's by negotiating proximity uh, in such a way uh, as to uh, get the audience's attention. Let's look at a couple of the slides. Don't hide behind the lectern. Uh, don't pace around like a caged animal. Use students to role play and act out models to keep the class moving and interesting. Uh, you can uh, ask for volunteers, and uh, oftentimes that's a factor of keeping getting attention that involves activity and uh, gets the audience interested in what's going on. Remember that ideas as well as people can move. Uh, you can uh, interject uh, something as uh, being you know, kind of an artifact, and uh, that artifact may be the thing that moves around and that commands attention. For instance, uh, what is this? Uh, some of you obviously say, well, that's a, a rubber ball, uh, but uh, I think uh, it can also be used uh, as an educational device. My three afternoon classes were rowdier than the morning class, so in a moment of inspiration, I turned to the conch shell from Lord of the Flies, except that in this case, it's a red foam ball. No student may speak unless he or she holds the ball. There's been some little giggles at misses, but it has become somewhat less rowdy. So this is an example of an educator uh, who has applied some technology uh, to his class. And uh, the technology isn't uh, like the technology that I'm interfacing with today. Rather, that technology uh, is just a little red ball. It's a, a foam ball that he uses to demonstrate whether or not a person has the floor uh, in his class. And that, uh, the use of that little red ball is a good example of putting objects in motion and uh, allowing the objects to kind of be active in your class. This next graphic is a sort of an illustration of how that's accomplished. You imbue objects with meaning. In this case, the little red ball means that you have permission to speak. You set them in motion, uh, and uh, it's thrown about the class, and the person who it's thrown to has the opportunity to speak. And then marvel at your success as a public speaker. This is another really good example. Uh, this is a geography class, and uh, this uh, particular teacher uh, has assigned a, a semester-long project uh, where the student will do in-depth research with regard to a particular uh, subject. And uh, the way that they choose the subject is not uh, just by virtue of what they might know about you know, a particular country. Uh, whatever the 
beach ball globe lands on uh, their right thumb, uh, that is the particular uh, country or, or region or ocean uh, that they will be charged with uh, delivering a, a address about and uh, producing a paper about uh, for the end of the semester. So hiding behind the lectern is a big mistake. The lectern serves to establish a physical barrier between the speaker and the audience, and as such, should be avoided. Uh, it is the personification of the ivory tower intellectual, and uh, typically uh, means that uh, you're you know, kind of driving the podium. Uh, all of us have seen public speakers uh, who are holding on to the podium for dear life. Uh, you will not be allowed a podium uh, in any of the speeches that you will deliver in this class. And the primary reason for that is because it makes you feel as though you have uh, this barrier that you've established between yourself and uh, between the audience. Also, being tethered to the lectern uh, for technological purposes is a crutch. You should get yourself the hardware that you need to be dynamic. And uh, in our case, uh, the hardware that you would need to be dynamic is a presentation remote. And uh, you will have uh, access to one of those presentation remotes each time that we speak in front of this audience. So that covers activity. Uh, the next uh, factor of keeping and gaining attention that we'll discuss is reality. Uh, reality uh, involves uh, invoking reality or suspending reality. And uh, S.I. Hirakawa uh, had a, uh, uh, an idea that you know, we, we categorize things from the most simple to the most complex. And uh, he talked really about the, uh, this ladder of abstraction. And uh, the ladder of abstraction uh, goes from the most simple things to the most complex. And uh, we have an example of that here in the next slide. We have a, a person, more specifically a teacher, more specifically uh, among the, the universe of teacher, a professor, uh, then uh, not just necessarily a professor, but a linguist, and not necessarily just a, a linguist, but someone who's had some interpreter training. And uh, finally, we come uh, to uh, the specific individual that we're talking about, or, or a more complicated explanation of what we're discussing, and that is Dr. Jerry Rice, uh, who is the director of the uh, Technical Spanish Program uh, here at OSU OKC. So I think that you get an idea of what I'm uh, talking about uh, when I discuss uh, S.I. Hirokawa's ab ladder of abstraction. And uh, one of the things that you need to be aware of is that in the invocation or the suspension of reality, S.I. Hirokawa's uh, ladder of abstraction uh, is very important because it's going to give you the ability to become more concrete as you get a little higher up on that ladder of abstraction. So uh, pay attention to that and think about how you can be less abstract and more concrete uh, as you invoke or suspend uh, reality. This uh, next slide is an interesting one. Uh, suspending reality uh, involves visualization. And uh, you need to paint a picture of how the world would look with or without something. So show the audience what the world would look like if we were to enact this policy. Or uh, more importantly, maybe what the world would look like if we failed to take action, if we failed to do something. What is the world going to look like? Uh, try to, uh, to help your audience envision a world uh, that is radically different from your own because we failed to take an action or because we continue to take an action. The tension between those two things uh, and between what they know and what you're describing will provoke continued attention. For example, uh, there was uh, a very interesting uh, television advertisement. And uh, the television advertisement was for Weyerhaeuser. And uh, Weyerhaeuser, some of you may know, is a uh, world famous uh, producer of paper. And they, uh, they make a lot of paper. Uh, products, they make wood. Uh, as you might imagine, they cut down a, a number of trees uh, to accomplish that aim. And uh, the picture, or rather the advertisement that I'm going to describe to you, uh, involved a elderly, kind of affable looking sort of grandfather figure. And uh, the grandfather figure uh, was playing shoots and ladders uh, with his granddaughter. And that's, of course, a, uh, an idyllic scene that all of us can identify with. We've all either played shoots and ladders or watched someone play shoots and ladders with someone else uh, at some point in our lives. And uh, he states to his little granddaughter, Jenny, that it is now time for them to leave. And uh, he has to take her back to her mother's house, uh, which he also tells us is just across the street. And she complains a little bit and kind of fusses a bit and says, oh, Grandpa, I don't want to go home yet. We're having such a good time. You know, can I stay just a little bit longer? One more game. And uh, he says, no, Jenny, it's time for you to go. Uh, your mother got very angry at me yesterday because I didn't have you in home in time for dinner. And uh, we need to respect her wishes, and this is the time that she wanted you home, so let's go. 
So uh, the two of them pack up and uh, they start heading towards the front door. And uh, when they get to the front door in the front entryway closet, they stop and they remove from the entryway closet two radiation suits and they begin to put the two radiation suits on. And uh, this is, you know, obviously a, a really, really complicated, you know, sort of picture. It's, it's, it's very much at odds, you know, with what we think you ought to put on uh, to walk across the street. And uh, she says, Jenny says to her grandfather, uh, Grandpa, what was it like before when we had trees? And uh, he looks up and kind of looks into the camera and then uh, he says, well, it was a much better place. And they walk out the front door and uh, they, you know, of course put on their helmets and walk out the front door and uh, they begin to pan back and you see that there are no, uh, there's no vegetation, there's no grass, there's no anything uh, green in their subdivision. And as they further begin to pan out, you see that they're living, you know, in a desert. And uh, as they further begin to pan out, you know, even farther, you know, to kind of a, a citywide or a statewide or even a countrywide view, you see that indeed there's nothing green anywhere in the United States. And uh, you get kind of that global shot and you see that there's nothing green, that all the land masses are brown or tan and uh, all of the oceans have been turned green. And uh, then they flash a, a little voice over there over the planet Earth and it says, Warehouser, that's why we replant two trees for every one tree that we plant down or that we, that we cut down. And uh, that's a really good example of this concept of visualization. Warehouser has painted a world uh, in which uh, they are not environmentally conscious corporate entities. And what they're attempting to, you know, to convince you of is that they engage in environmentally sound practices. And those environmentally sound practices are going to result in a whole uh, earth in, in a world that doesn't become uh, decertified, uh, in, a, in a world that you know, doesn't involve there being deserts uh, where these uh, lush kind of uh, green sort of suburban you know, kind of areas used to be. And uh, that, I think, is a, a very powerful example of visualization. Uh, they paint a picture of what the world would look like if they were not to engage in the environmentally sound practices uh, that they're engaged in. Now, there's some debate, of course, uh, whether or not that actually is an environmentally sound uh, practice. Uh, some folks uh, would refer, refer to uh, their advertisement as greenwashing. They would say that that is indeed not uh, a very environmentally sound practice because although they do replant two trees for each one they cut down, uh, the trees that they cut down are all of the same type, and they're, they're trees that typically are good for making paper, they're trees that are good for uh, making uh, feet of, of, of wood uh, to construct homes and, and for construction materials. So uh, a lot of folks would say that that's a greenwashed sort of advertisement, and that indeed uh, what they are attempting uh, to, to sell you is a bill of goods, uh, because when you go in and you cut down all of those trees, uh, you are destroying habitat, and uh, you replace that habitat with a monoculture, and uh, as a result, uh, what you, you know, have is, is indeed not very environmentally conscious. So let's look at the next slide. Uh, you are going to attempt to paint pe people an idyllic picture and then uh, possibly show uh, how that idyllic uh, picture could become despoiled. Uh, obviously, uh, a nuclear war uh, is uh, the, the most extreme kind of manifestation of this visualization, uh, but we find that visualization is indeed a very powerful uh, form of keeping people's attention. So uh, that is uh, uh, reality, and that's our discussion of reality. Uh, why don't we uh, transition next to our next factor of keeping and getting attention, and that is proximity. Proximity. How close is too close? Uh, Edward T. Hall in 1966 wrote this book called The Hidden Dimension, and uh, The Hidden Dimension uh, was a, uh, an excellent example uh, of nonverbal communication, and uh, Edward T. Hall is really one of the, uh, the front runners, the forerunners of the study of nonverbal communication. And uh, in his 1966 book, he talked about the difference between intimate, uh, which uh, happens between close friends and mates, uh, that is all the way up, you know, touching up to 1.5 feet. And uh, if you, you know, are a, a student of Aikido, uh, if you've uh, studied any martial arts, uh, you know that uh, intimate or, or touching you uh, is part of your personal space. They also teach you in Aikido that uh, everything uh, up to the reach of your hand is considered your personal space. So if someone comes inside of that area right there, uh, then you are supposed to, uh, of course, grab them, put them in some kind of a, uh, an awkward position and attempt to uh, break their elbow. 
Uh, so uh, Aikido uh, would teach us that uh, you need to pay a lot of attention to uh, people's personal space and that unless you're uh, willing to uh, get broken in half Steven Seagal style, uh, that it is not a good idea to come inside of people's personal space. Personal space there is touching all the way up to 1.5 feet. Casual uh, is typically uh, the type of distance orientation that you have with your coworkers and uh, with colleagues, and that's usually 1.5 feet to 4 feet. Uh, these are people that you know, that you feel comfortable with, uh, people that you deal with every day, uh, but not necessarily uh, uh, people that you're that you're intimate with, uh, that you're you know maybe in a long-term relationship with, or that you you know feel comfortable touching. And uh, typically, we all know you know whether or not we fit inside of one of those uh, two categories or not. Uh, then we have social. These are acquaintances. These are people that you just met. These are people at a party. And uh, the demonstration that I like to do uh, of this one uh, is a pretty simple one. And that is we've all been to a party before and uh, we were introduced to someone new for the first time. Uh, we uh, walked up to that person and maybe we you know, kind of planted on this back foot, leaned in a little bit, shook their hand, looked them right in the eye, said, very nice to meet you, glad to meet you, glad to, glad to see that you're here. And then we retract our hand, take a step back, and then maybe take another step back just like that, okay? And uh, that's typically our social you know, kind of interaction. Although we may have reached in and touched that person in a, in a, in a socially acceptable way, uh, in a time-honored you know, kind of nonverbal tradition, we typically take another step back and then possibly even another step back after that. And uh, you can experiment around with that at a party. Uh, pretty much that is uh, how your nonverbal orientation towards meeting that new person works. Uh, that is social interaction. Once again, those are acquaintances and people that you just met, uh, five feet uh, up to 12 feet. And last is public. And uh, public is uh, 12 uh, to 25 feet. Public is where most public speaking occurs uh, in that 12 to 25 foot range. Uh, for the most part in this class, you will be presenting speeches uh, in front of an audience. And uh, those uh, people will uh, be the, uh, the folks uh, who are you know, sitting in the seats uh, whenever you get around to, to delivering your address. So uh, typically it's that 12 to 25 foot range uh, that you're looking at uh, for your audience members. And uh, the, the other one that I might kind of add to uh, Edward T. Hall's uh, sort of uh, nonverbal social distance kind of orientation is mediated uh, communication. And that's communication like the communication that I'm delivering to you right now. Uh, you, of course, know that I am in a classroom and that I am delivering a lecture. Uh, however, uh, that lecture may have been uh, recorded a long time ago. It may have been recorded even, you know, uh, as many as, as a couple of thousand miles away from where you're actually viewing uh, this particular lecture today. So uh, mediated communication kind of breaks uh, a lot of uh, Edward uh, T. Hall's principles about uh, public speaking and about uh, communication. Uh, because it may look as though you're, you know, fairly close to me, uh, you know, you know that that's just sort of a canard of the technology that I'm using to record this lecture, and uh, that it's not really uh, how close you actually are to me. Uh, so, as a result of that, you know, uh, another dimension of public speaking that I would add uh, with regard to nonverbal communication is mediated communication, and that's communication that takes place uh, over the computer, like the lecture that you are watching today. So that covers uh, part of uh, Edward T. Hall's uh, proxemics theory. And uh, you can look at this graphic and kind of uh, see an extension of that. Uh, you have uh, intimate there, 1.5, uh, up to touching up to 1.5 feet, casual 1.5 to 4 feet, social 4 to 12 feet, and public speaking 12 to 28 feet. So that covers proximity. It's of course a great, uh, conf it's a great uh, pu public speaking tool to use uh, to negotiate uh, for uh, attention. Let's talk about a couple of uh, ways uh, that you can use that to negotiate attention uh, before we uh, move on to the next one, which is conflict. Uh, one of the ways that you can use that is uh, if you are speaking to a group of people and maybe two or three people are being particularly rowdy, uh, two or three people aren't paying a whole lot of attention to you, uh, one of the things that you can do is you can get out from behind the lectern, you can go negotiate uh, for proximity with that other person. Uh, so that's another reason why it's very important uh, to potentially leave the lectern and uh, one of the reasons why you will not be afforded a lectern uh, for your speeches in this class is because it gives you that false sense of security. And uh, if, if the, it also gives the audience members a false sense of security. If they think that you are tied uh, up there to the lectern and that you're not going to come out from behind it, then they feel more comfortable kind of sitting over here uh, in the last row and uh, talking. And uh, if that is the case, 
when you leave the lectern and get a little bit closer to them, uh, that's going to automatically, you know, that they know that they shouldn't be talking, that they ought to be paying more attention. That's going to automatically, you know, make them pay more attention to what you're saying and what you have to, what you have to communicate with them there today. So proximity is one of the great factors of keeping and gaining attention, and I would encourage you to use it uh, as, as, as such. The next factor of keeping and gaining attention that we're going to talk about is conflict. And uh, conflict is a very effective uh, factor of keeping and gaining attention. Uh, obviously, we think conflict is effective because uh, people love a good fight. How else can you explain uh, why professional wrestling makes so much money and why people pay so much attention to professional wrestling? Conflict, even fake, is profitable. And uh, the, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly summarize kind of uh, what some of those slides uh, state. Uh, conflict uh, in professional wrestling last year uh, in the fiscal year of uh, May 2005 to April 2006 uh, generated the World Wrestling uh, Federation approximately $400 million. Uh, in addition to that, uh, they had a net profit of around $47 million, most of which went uh, directly into uh, the McMahon uh, family fortune. Uh, in addition to that, in August of 2006, the company's market capitalization or what they would be worth if someone attempted to come in and purchase uh, all of their stock or buy uh, that particular company, uh, they were a market capitalized uh, estimate of $1 billion. Uh, so if you wanted to come in and buy the WWE, uh, it, would, it would cost you somewhere around a $1 billion. Uh, and it is, uh, for the most part, an entity uh, that exists based on its ability to generate this conflict and based on its ability uh, to uh, provide this conflict to uh, its studio audience. Hey yo, you making fun of wrestling? You know that's not good for your health. Yeah, Al, I am making fun of wrestling. What are you going to do about it? All I'm saying is that there's other ways to discuss conflict without picking on wrestling. Maybe you should choose one of those if you know what's good for you. Understand? No, I don't understand, and I've got academic freedom, and I'll talk about whatever I want to in this class. You can't tell me what I'm going to discuss and what I won't discuss, and any of your mafia knee-breaking tactics aren't going to work on me, because in case you haven't noticed, I'm a big guy and I know some Aikido. So, bring it. That is, of course, a simulation uh, of conflict, and uh, some of you may have thought that the most interesting part of this entire lecture uh, was whenever I was uh, talking back and forth to the animated avatar uh, who was threatening to do me bodily harm. Uh, so that's a good example of how conflict uh, can, can work to keep the audience's attention. It keeps them engaged uh, in the material. And uh, we can look throughout, uh, throughout recorded history and throughout a, a number of different disciplines and see that there's tons of uh, instances of conflict uh, that you as a public speaker can draw upon. Every discipline quarrels with itself. Uh, history, uh, in particular, is full of conflict, uh, wars, diplomatic initiatives, and elections. Uh, we also have business, which is full of stories about conflict or actual conflicts. Uh, some of those include things like lawsuits, buyouts, and hostile takeovers. Social scientists also engage in a great deal of conflict. And those are educators who differ about different educational models, healthcare professionals uh, who differ about you know, uh, diagnoses and treatments, literary critics, computer scientists, all of them engage in conflict. And uh, the thing is that we find it fascinating. Uh, whenever people engage uh, in that conflict and whenever you know, we have an opportunity to view that, uh, those are invariably the things that we pay the most attention to. Uh, you, you have to look no further than the tabloids that are on sale at your local supermarket in the checkout aisle uh, to confirm that this is indeed the case. Uh, people enjoy looking at those tabloids. Uh, oftentimes they involve conflict. So-and-so uh, and so-and-so and -so are getting a divorce. So-and-so and so-and-so. And -so uh, had, uh, you know, the uh, police uh, arrive at their, you know, mansion and, uh, you know, uh, Bobby Brown and, and Whitney Houston or, you know, Britney Spears and Kevin Federline or, you know, Tim McGraw and Faith Hill, uh, you know, Oprah and Stedman. All of these things are great examples of how these publications, and I use the word publications lightly, uh, how these publications sell newspapers. They do so based on their use of conflict and uh, we uh, buy tons of them uh, as a result of that. So understand that it's a very potent way to get any audience's attention, and it's something that we've uh, used uh, for thousands of years. One of the first scholars uh, to kind of put some of that information uh, in, down in a written format uh, was Aristotle. And a number of the things uh, that we're uh, talking about in today's uh, discussion of, of 
uh, the factors of keeping and gaining attention all kind of go back to uh, Arist Aristotle and uh, Aristotelian uh, sort of uh, studies of, of different things. And uh, Aristotle uh, was uh, one of the people who wrote uh, the first uh, textbook on composition, and uh, he wrote a book called The Poetics. And uh, in The Poetics, uh, he says that the heart of every conflict uh, is between a protagonist and an antagonist. And uh, the protagonist is typically the uh, person that we're rooting for, uh, the person that you know, we, are, we are hoping will prevail uh, in any particular given situation, and an antagonist. And that is the character that is working against the protagonist, not necessarily the enemy, but uh, someone who is uh, working against the antagonist, who is typically the person that we're rooting for. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in Poetics, he indicated that conflict gives a story its life and its value, and Aristotle identified five conflicts that a protagonist must resolve in order to achieve wisdom. Man versus himself, guilt or a decision that must be made, man versus man, man versus society or a group, man versus technology, anything man-made, man versus nature, the nature of the world or the earth or the air, or the forest or the weather, and also the supernatural, which uh, included spirits, ghosts, and uh, vampires or God. Uh, so those are all different things that we can engage in conflict with. And if you'll think back about any novel that you've ever read or uh, any television program that you watch on a regular basis, uh, most of the, of the reason why you pay attention to it is because of the conflict. It's because of the things that, uh, that you know, have to be resolved uh, in order for the plot uh, to advance. And uh, those plot complications almost always involve some form of conflict. So uh, if you want to be an effective public speaker, if you want to have a, a great uh, you know, a command of the audience's attention, then try to integrate as much uh, conflict into the presentation as possible. That will help you immensely. That covers conflict. Let's talk about our uh, next uh, factor of keeping and getting attention, and that is humor. Humor. Humor is the most dangerous of the factors of keeping and gaining attention. And the reason why humor is the most dangerous of the factors of keeping and gaining attention is because humor will either allow you to own the room or fall flat on your face. And uh, the reason I say that is because uh, humor typically tends to be a very subjective thing. Uh, in addition to that, humor is really kind of an insight into your psyche. It's an insight into your soul as a person, uh, into you know, what you think is funny. Uh, what you think is funny may be radically different than what the audience thinks is funny, and if you prove to the audience that you indeed do have a radically different sense of humor than they have, uh, then that is one of the things that kind of demonstrates that you are not like the audience. Uh, so uh, for that particular reason, uh, humor can be something that you know, is very risky to use. Uh, that's what makes it the most dangerous of the factors of keeping and getting attention. What you think is funny says a lot about you as a person, and it also says a lot about your audience. If they don't laugh, then you're probably not like them. Uh, for instance, uh, you may or may not have been to a training session, uh, which happened really early in the morning, and uh, maybe uh, the, the trainer rolled in and you know, they, they got there right at starting time, and uh, they said, gosh, you gotta forgive me, I'm just you know, really not a morning person, and uh, you know, I need to you know, drink some more coffee, and uh, it's probably gonna take me 30 minutes you know, to have a pulse, and uh, you know, I, I apologize uh, that you know, I'm that way. And uh, meanwhile, you know, you are a morning person and you're there and you're ready to go. And yeah, it may be a little bit early, but you know, you've paid your money, you know, to, to learn uh, from this person. And uh, as a result of their, their attitude, you know, that early in the morning, it really kind of sets the entire day's festivities off on, on sort of a bad foot. So uh, be aware of that and uh, be aware of, you know, uh, you, you may be, you know, interjecting something that's kind of lighthearted and uh, you may be attempting to generate humor but in actuality, your audience really looks at it as a slight uh, against them, uh, indicating that you are not like them. So that's why it's one of the more dangerous ones. Uh, conversely, if you uh, make them laugh, then they will think that you are smart, witty, and erudite. They will think that you are one of the best public speakers that, you have, uh, that they have ever seen because you made them laugh. Uh, so you know, be aware of that. This next graphic is kind of funny, and uh, it's sort of an extension of uh, what I was talking about just a moment ago, and that is uh, she uh, is telling one of her subordinates, always start your presentation off with a joke, but don't mention religion, politics, race, sex, age, men, women, children, technology, food, drinking, pregnancy, or exercise. 
And uh, the reason that you should refrain uh, from talking about any of those uh, potential subjects is because all of those uh, have with them kind of some hidden uh, landmines, uh, so to speak, some things that you could potentially uh, begin to discuss uh, that might be problematic, some things uh, that if you were to uh, get you know, too far uh, into that joke might offend someone. And uh, you know, the, the old adage uh, says that, that one person's trash is another person's treasure. Uh, what one person finds hysterically funny, uh, another person will be very offended by. And uh, that is an important thing to remember uh, whenever you're engaging in humor. So you want to go, hopefully, uh, with a joke uh, that is appropriate for that situation and that does not offend anyone in the audience. The only problem with playing it safe when you're using humor is that when you play it safe, you don't really swing for the fences. And uh, if you don't really swing for the fences, people will also think that person tried to be funny, but that just wasn't a very funny joke. A joke for you. How many graduate assistants does it take to change a light bulb? One, but it takes nine years. Okay, a couple of you out there in video land uh, probably engaged in a small little micro chuckle, kind of a, <laughs> that was funny, uh, or something like that, uh, whenever you read that joke or whenever you heard me deliver that joke. And the reason for that is outside of uh, folks uh, who have been in school for nine years getting a PhD uh, or in school for almost a decade, you know, getting a variety of different postgraduate degrees, you probably didn't think that that was a very funny joke. Uh, if you are, you know, taking this class, for associate degree credit, or if you're taking this class uh, for undergraduate bachelor's degree credit, uh, then you have not been in school uh, for nine years or, or close to a decade, and you probably don't think uh, that the how many uh, graduate assistants does it take to change a light bulb joke is very funny. And uh, if that is the case, then I would have just proven to my audience how I am not like them. Conversely, if I was giving a faculty enhancement uh, lecture or a seminar uh, about how to be become a better you know, faculty member, faculty members uh, would have probably thought that that was a pretty funny joke. And it would, have, it would have solicited much more than just a little you know, kind of courtesy micro chuckle or grin. Uh, it would have you know, probably demonstrated in a couple of you know, people full, full belly you know, sort of laughter. Uh, but for your particular demographic, it did not. Uh, and that's a, a, a very good example of how you can demonstrate a lack of similarity with the audience and how telling a bad joke, uh, a safe joke, uh, can ultimately end up harming you as a public speaker. I'd like to uh, conclude our uh, lecture, this uh, particular lecture, by telling you a brief story about a gentleman named Scott. And uh, Scott was a student uh, in my class, and I have a picture of Scott there. Scott uh, was a great student. Scott came to class every day for the first six or seven weeks of the semester. And uh, it was difficult to miss Scott because Scott sat up front. Scott uh, was a military uh, uh, child, a uh, child of a military family. And uh, he had been all over. He had been to a number of different foreign countries. Uh, he had lived uh, you know, really all over the world. Uh, he had lived in four different continents and uh, was just a, a joy uh, to have in class. Uh, one of those kids uh, who is really kind of advanced beyond his years and uh, really interesting because the stories that he would tell, you know, uh, there, was, there was something in it for everyone in, in every class. And uh, he was, you know, very respectful of other people and uh, really just kind of a conversation starter uh, in the section that I had Scott in. And uh, Scott was in one of my public speaking classes uh, a number of years ago. Um, ran into a little bit of a problem, though, with Scott. Um, I figured, though, but because he likes to travel, uh, that he might be missing class because he had taken a trip. And uh, it just so happened that he was missing uh, the week of class right before spring break. So I thought that maybe he wanted to use his spring break plus a week uh, to you know, go someplace and that he was you know, probably surfing in Bali and uh, that I would hear from him uh, immediately following spring break. But uh, his attendance problems uh, really seemed to kind of progress and uh, didn't hear from Scott uh, after spring break. And uh, that uh, absence after spring break was, of course, his third uh, missed absence. So I decided that I would give Scott a phone call and uh, tried to get him uh, on his cell phone uh, to no avail. Uh, finally, as sort of a measure of last resort, I called his home number and uh, left a, a message there on the answering machine. Uh, I was uh, called back uh, very quickly, uh, not by Scott, uh, but rather by Scott's parents. And Scott's parents were very concerned uh, 
uh, that he had not uh, been coming to class. And uh, they said that he had recently been fired from his job and uh, that he was in the area and that he was uh, safe. He was not, uh, you know, uh, the victim of an automobile accident or something like that. So I didn't need to worry about his health. Uh, but uh, that they were concerned because he had sort of been hanging out with a new group of people and uh, that they didn't really like this new crowd that he was running around with and that they were concerned about their son. And I said, well, I'm very sorry to hear that you're concerned uh, about Scott's welfare. Uh, you know, I, I encourage you to have uh, some, some conversations with Scott, you know, about his future. And uh, if he gets back, you know, to my class here for this next class period, uh, he's only missed, you know, the class four times up to this point, and I, I don't really see any reason why he couldn't finish up strong and still do well in the course. Uh, I think that, you know, I would make some extra effort to get an extraordinary uh, student like Scott caught up at this point, so please, you know, have him drop by and contact me uh, as quickly as possible. So uh, didn't really think too much of it and uh, just kind of went on about my day. Uh, the next morning, though, I got a phone call from the parents and uh, happened to be, you know, there during office hours, and uh, they called me up and they said, Mr. Stone, uh, we are uh, concerned. Uh, we had a question. We wanted to run it by you. Scott, uh, usually whenever he leaves the house to run around with this new group of people, does so. And uh, when he leaves, he takes this black duffel bag with him. But today, he did not take the black duffel bag with him. Today, instead of taking the black duffel bag with him, he left the black duffel bag in the bottom of his closet. We're thinking about opening it. What do you think? And I said, no, I would not open the black duffel bag. Uh, Scott, uh, you know, that's his personal property. If he wanted you to know what was in that, uh, he would not have put it inside the black duffel bag. Uh, if you want to know what's in that, it is still under your roof. And I think that you're entitled to know, you know, what is in the black duffel bag. Uh, but my advice to you, sir, is to have an open and honest conversation with your son about what is in the black duffel bag. And uh, he said, well... I appreciate your input and uh, what you're saying you know, is probably correct, but I think we're going to open the black duffel bag. And I said, well, sir, I caution you against that. I encourage you to not do that. And uh, then my curiosity really got the better of me. And uh, I really had no choice but to ask, I don't think that you should open it, but I want to know what was in the black duffel bag. And uh, they walked over to the bed. They put the black duffel bag on top of the bed, and they unzipped the black duffel bag. And inside of the black duffel bag was every type of whip and chain and bondage device that you could imagine. And uh, they were, of course, very disconcerted. They, uh, they you know, were relaying all this information to me on the phone. And uh, the mother uh, was distraught. I could visibly hear her you know, crying in the background. And uh, she fell to her knees, and uh, she began to wail. And uh, she said, uh, you know, my God, what are we going to do? I cannot believe you know, that our son is involved in this, that it's come to this. And uh, how are we going to handle this? And uh, the father looked up, and uh, he said uh, into the telephone receiver, I'll never forget what he said. You know what he said? He said, well, it's obvious that we can't beat the boy. That's an example of humor. Uh, if this were a packed uh, class uh, full of students, you would have heard all of them chuckle and laugh. Uh, Aristotle, over 5,000 years ago, said that when you're speaking to a group of young people that you should make much of the topic of sex, and when you're speaking to a group of old people that you should make much of the topic of money, because neither group cares very much about anything else. I hope that you enjoyed the first half, the first five of our 11 components of the factors of keeping and gaining attention. Uh, the next video uh, in this series uh, includes the last six of the factors of keeping and gaining attention. These are vital to holding on to your audience's attention in any circumstance. Thank you.